The T2 Tile project is building an indefinitely scalable computational stack. Follow our progress here on T Tuesday Updates. So the Artificial Life Conference was last week. I've uh, been aiming at that for over a year. We were originally hoping to have a whole grid all set up and running. It was supposed to be in Montreal, became virtual online because of the pandemic, so I had my first Zoom experience, uh, uh, but uh, it was it was really quite uh, impressive all along. Uh, uh, Monday morning, bright and early, the very first event of the conference was Functional Programming for Artificial Life, a tutorial by my friend and colleague Lance Williams. Uh, he is a big Functional Programming and Haskell fan, so the tutorial was all monads all of the time, but by the end of the time he was showing us this absolutely crazy stuff these uh, piles roving piles of, of chemical like things that interact with each other according to the rules of functional programming combinators uh, like lambda expressions and so forth on super steroids thing has a mother with a program that copies itself extrudes it into a daughter and then pinches it off, does the whole thing, and that then continues. It's absolutely crazy stuff. And it's implemented in stuff that's pretty close, not quite, but pretty close to stuff that you could imagine doing in something like the movable feast machine. I did my tutorial uh, on Monday as well, uh, uh, programming soft A-Life with Splat and Ulam. It ended up being mostly Ulam because I was working bottom up. I was characterizing the movable feast machine as a chaotic good cellular automata, trying to drive home the idea that it's not merely asynchronous, but it's viciously asynchronous. Tiles can come and go, things can get blocked and then start up again and so forth. Uh, uh, did examples like Hello World, which was pointing out that it's really like Goodbye World, right? Because a typical Hello World program, it does one thing and then it exits. Living computations don't exit lightly. Uh, uh, did 2 plus 2. Why do 2 plus 2? Because you say int x, y, z. Well, you can't do that in Ulam. It takes up too much space. 32, 32, 34, that's 96. Haven't got that many bits. Uh, uh, eventually worked our way up to the swap line, which was going to tie into the uh, lightning talk that I gave at the end of last week, uh, um, uh, which I showed first in Ulam and then also in Splat. And... <coughs> Uh, Liza Shulyayeva, uh, I guess, was at the tutorial and, and put up, she calls them hasty notes, but they're really quite impressive. Uh, they go on and on and, and really get you know, pretty much the, the main points I was trying to make. Uh, uh, the goal in de useful scales, you know, in indefinite scalability has a personal note about, you know, don't we already have indefinite scalability? And, and certainly I was going too fast and trying to cover strict indefinite scalability takes a little bit of extra unpacking, which I didn't do, you know. You can't, you know, so when you say just restart your program, you have two cases. Either the program sits on one host uh, uh, and does its job, and if that's the case, then you're limited by however many address bits the fit and RAM of the machine that you're dealing with. And if it's a network program that's designed to scale out uh, on the uh, IP network, well, then you're limited by IP address space. And people think, oh, well, IP address space is really big. It is really big. But it's strict indefinite scalability is actually more of a design philosophy that just when you actually cash it out in specific finitely scalable cases, you always run up against something like 64-bit address space of RAM or 128 bits of address space for IP6. Uh, uh, and the, the limit itself is less important than the fact that if you try to get away from it, it pushes your whole design philosophy in another direction. But these notes are great. Uh, uh, oh, and we grew a new section uh, <laughs> in the uh, uh, Living Computation Foundation uh, 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 org, Living Computation org website for for education, uh, uh, education and outreach. Compared to other living machinery on Earth, the human species has had the success it has had primarily because of its abilities and propensities to educate and learn from each other. That's really the bottom line, and that's why the Living Computation Foundation has this two pronged mission.
education, research and development like building the teach you tiles, and education and outreach to spread the information about there being another way to compute that we need to start building up an engineering and science body of knowledge about how to compute in the living computation style. Uh, um, so in the education section, we have a, a, a thing for the tutorial, memorializing the tutorial, uh, uh, the uh, code samples and scripts and so forth to, for anybody to try it on a virtual machine, of uh, Ubuntu virtual machine or a real one if one has it. Uh, the slides are up in PDF and the, and the YouTube video of the recording from the Zoom is, is linked there as well. Uh, uh, yes, and... Finally, <laughs> uh, working on the website, I got around to finally uh, running the uh, thank you script. So our latest uh, Living Computation Foundation nerds, uh, uh, Damien and Jason, uh, um, thank you, uh, uh, have, should hopefully have their official nerd numbers sent out to them. We're into the 230s now. Uh, uh, another tutorial was the Bibbits by Leo Cosson. Uh, uh, I didn't even know how to, I'm not sure I'm saying his name right, I didn't even know how to say the Bibbits until I heard his tutorial uh, um, and and this was good because you know so as he says he's not a researcher when he first started the project he didn't even know that a life was a thing with a name he was just doing it because it was cool uh, um, and a lot of people come to a life that way and it's really good it's great and uh, one of the things that's really important about the artificial life conferences is trying to make room for as many of those new folks to come in as possible and and Leo doing a tutorial is exactly an example of that you know it, it took a bit of guts on his part to, to come on out and do it but it was great. And so he's doing a thing where, you know, you directly engineer the genes that go in your creatures and, uh, you know, sort of in the spirit of Steve Grant's creatures uh, from the 90s and lots of other systems that people work on. It's the typical way that people, when they first come at it, work on it. And, and it's great. And really, you know, even if there's evolution within the creatures that are being simulated, the larger scale of evolution is the developer, as he says, continuing to add wow factor and continuing to edit the thing and, and develop new stuff. Uh, um, and, you know, he's doing five-digit subscribers, six-digit views for his videos. He's doing really good. So that's good. That's education and outreach of a whole nother sort. Uh, uh, he kind of... <laughs> <laughs> uh, he stressed the idea of having it being an ongoing thing versus the sort of one and done, one paper, one thesis, and so forth, uh, which, you know, and I really agree, uh, uh, is a problem with artificial life. You get these, you know, single starts that explore one idea and then poof, they're gone. Uh, um, and, you know, he calls out uh, Splat and the T2 Tile Project as examples of things that are ongoing. Thank you. Uh, uh, you know, one, the, one view of it is it's a long-going project because it's a long-going project, and one is it's a long-going project because I make progress so slow. But uh, I totally agree. The benefits of a community, especially for accountability and motivation, you guys, and uh, you beings, uh, uh, you, you, folk, you really help me uh, uh, by letting me know you're there making comments and, and, and so forth. So I uh, uh, super appreciate that. And hopefully, you know, we'll continue to have progress for a while here. Uh, um, and on that, so I've talked about Mike 11 before. Before, he did the first keynote uh, of the A-Life conference, and it's just more crazy stuff. Why don't robots get cancer? I mean, he has this thing where, you know, you have you know, it's biological models where they have cancer tumors forming, and by screwing around with the bioelectric fields, I mean, it sounds like the matrix, uh, uh, by changing the ion channels to affect the thing, the cancer goes away. Uh, uh, I mean, it, it almost sounds like New Age woo, but... Michael Levin is hardcore. It's great stuff. Uh, um, you know, and he's lots of crazy examples. You cut the tail off a salamander, you graft it on where the leg's supposed to be. The tail turns into a leg all the way down to fingers. <coughs> And he shows some of these two-headed planaria worms that they make by cutting them apart and stitching together and messing with the bioelectric ion channels so that the developmental process gets confused about which end is the head and starts growing heads at both ends. And, you know, in his talk, this is, this is video, so you can see the little goofy little googly eyes at each end of this thing. It's really kind of weird. But in the video, this thing is swimming around. And, you know, how does a two-headed creature swim around? It swims around in a U-shape. <laughs> 
uh, mostly, although it seems like the bigger head uh, uh, tends to dominate when they d uh, actually end up going one way versus the other. Similarly, you can take embryonic eye cells and graft them onto a <coughs> tadpole's butt, <laughs> uh, and it will grow into an eye that works. How? Because the eye cells put out an optic nerve, the optic nerve cells look for the brain that they're supposed to hook onto, don't find it, find the spinal cord, make active synapses onto the spinal cord, and the whole nervous system eventually adapts to uh, use those signals so that the eye is providing information about lighting behind you. This is exactly the kind of thing that we're exploring by trying to say, how can we re take a high-level goal and re-engineer it into something so that you can make progress locally. You can wake up, you can look around at yourself, and you can say, well, uh, based on what I see here, I should grow in that direction. That's exactly how embryology manifestly clearly works and it's only because we have this kind of conscious thought model where we think everything stays in one position everything has to be told what to do that this even surprises us really we should be expecting this and and the more i get you know immersed in bottom-up multi-scale agency at all levels like agency at the level of embryonic eye cells making decisions based on local conditions about the smartest thing how can they most help well, clearly, we should grow and, and, and hook up to the thing that seems most brain-like. That you know, This is just a consequence of making a, a complex, high-level, high-order goal, breaking it down into locally uh, low-order accessible components. It's great examples all through it. Uh, he, there he is uh, himself. He was in a second uh, workshop later as well. More stuff that, like, you don't even have to get the number of cells right. And even if you have only one cell, it'll make a tube around a whole thing. Great stuff. Uh, uh, there's Josh Bongard. This was in the, in the later uh uh, workshop. Uh, they're trying to set up a Proteus Institute, which is aiming at trying to be able to transfer learning between radically different systems. It's very ambitious. I, I pushed back a little bit on it. I mean, I, I think in principle, this can be made to work, but trying to do this on top of traditional deterministic computing is going to be a big lift. Uh, but they're hoping to be able to transfer from like soft simulated voxel uh, robots to uh, Melanie Moses swarm robots, you know, and, and get a learning speed up by crossing species in effect. It's great stuff. I did my lightning talk. Uh, uh, it, this is five minutes. It, uh, it's up on the Dave Ackley channel. I encourage folks to take a look at it. I sort of include it in our T Tuesday update by reference. Uh, um, and uh, it went okay. Uh, um, it, it, it I did it using OpenOffice instead of the software that I usually do. Uh, and OpenOffice has a better ability to include little movie clips. And, and, and that's one of the disadvantages of this uh, visualization software is it doesn't. I think I want to work on that. But the lightning talk went OK. Uh, 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 I built up to showing stuff that wasn't even in the paper uh, where we could do uh, have a little local stuff that was sorting itself out locally and then having uh, passing computation across it and then having the entire computation moving down the grid as that was happening and they got it working but that wasn't even it there was a whole bunch of art exhibits uh, this was the people's choice uh, award submission I didn't vote in the people's choice award because I had gotten roped into being one of the official judges uh, uh, there was lots of really interesting stuff and you know from every dimension from you know sort of ambient sound recordings in natural environments environments to uh, uh, explicit sort of A-life electronica to uh, quilts uh, uh, that had, you know, living system mechanical life interconnections and so forth. Uh, the uh, Art and the Science Award went to this thing called Blind Painter that we liked by Mitsuyoshi Yamazaki. There was a ton of great stuff. There was a Minecraft <laughs> server uh, uh, specifically for the conference, and, and you can see the, the, the topiary uh, uh, robot horse uh, from the conference poster now exists in 3D in the Minecraft server. Somebody carved Ulam into the side of a mountain uh, uh, in uh, in the Minecraft server after the first day for the tutorials. You know, thank you. Uh, <laughs> yeah, uh, and and really, uh, everybody, the, the team that organized this, Josh and Juniper and Lauren, 
they were they were working nonstop the whole week, especially Juniper. She was everywhere. She was the conference mom, not just doing technical stuff, but also asking questions and herding people from one uh, lecture hall to another and so forth. It was remarkably well done. Uh, um, <clears throat> if anybody could keep up with the sort of thing that Ju Juniper did, it's probably Jitka, who's uh, running the conference next year, uh, ALIFE 2021, which is going to be a combination of physical uh, uh, in Prague, in Czechoslovakia, plus virtual online. We certainly want to have the Living Computation Foundation, the T2 Tile Project, having some significant visibility uh, uh, there. Whether we actually go to Prague or not depends on the state of the world, uh, uh, but uh, who knows? We shall see. So uh, uh, that was A Life 2020. Uh, going forward, uh, I want to get back to the work on the Native Engine. We've still got bugs. I want to build a second power zone because that's the, the last untried thing: is having two separately powered grids, subgrids that are connected together that should be exchanging data, even though they're not exchanging power. And if I can, if I can, if I can dare myself to try to get down and figure out what's going on with those guys that won't reboot, if they're in the middle of a powered up grid, but they'll all power up okay by themselves. That's hopefully make progress on as many of those as possible by next time. And that's it. The next update will be August 4th. I hope you guys or you folks uh, uh, are doing okay. Thank you so much for being here, helping support the project. Hope to see you next time.